everybody. We are just about ready to get started. Um, we have a little, a short introduction from the Montana World Affairs Council um, to introduce Ambassador Bark Struggles. Uh, I'd like to introduce Max Delvin from the Montana World Affairs Council. Morning, everybody. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Yeah. Let's let's make this so that Max, my friend, is slightly taller than I am. Oh, <laughs> you can you can kneel. I can do that too. Yeah, <laughs> I'll go down for you. Oh no, that's a little too short. <laughs> I think you'll be just fine. Great. You want to see me anyways? All right. Uh, well, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Max Delvin. I'm an intern with the Montana World Affairs Council. Uh, this is a live program streaming to you from Rwanda. We're all very excited to have you with us. Uh, before I introduce our guests, I wanted to thank our Council of the Classroom sponsors. Uh, those are the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Stockman Bank, Trail West Bank, Northwestern Energy, and Neptune Aviation. Uh, Ambassador, uh, Erica Bark Struggles is the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Rwanda. She previously served for three years as U.S. Consul General in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, from January of 2009 to July of 2011, Ms. Bark Struggles <laughs> served as the Deputy to the U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations, uh, leading the Washington Office for Ambassador Susan Rice and serving on the Deputies Committee. Uh, she's a career Foreign, Servant o Foreign Service Officer and has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and has been posted to India, Norway, and South Africa. Uh, from 1990, uh, 1996 to 1999, she was a Director for African Affairs at the National Security Council at the White House, where she led the successful effort to pass the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. She has also been a Visiting Fellow at the Brookings Institution, and an International Affairs Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, studying the economic impact of HIV AIDS on businesses in Southern Africa and the AIDS crisis. Uh, I will now turn this over to Ambassador uh, Bark Struggles. Thank you. And before we do that really quick, I just want to share with our students so we have um, a little concept of what, where Rwanda is, just so we all know. Um, so here we are in Montana, right about there. And then here is, of course, Africa. And so Rwanda is right here. And so if I go and we make that slightly larger, you can see exactly where we are connecting to. So that is quite a, quite a distance that we are spanning today um, to talk with Ambassador Bark Struggles. And I believe, um, Ambassador Bark Struggles, are you, are you there and are you ready? Great, thank you very much. Um, I can see some folks, I can't see other classrooms, so I'm hoping they can hear and see me. Um, it is a real pleasure to, to be here today, um, and I really want to thank, first of all, um, Montana uh, World Affairs Council for the invitation to speak to you all um, and for the opportunity to talk to, you, talk to you today. And somebody has their microphone not on mute because I'm getting back feed, so if you have a microphone, if you can put it on mute, that would be great. Um, um, let me just say, first of all, um, I have been ambassador to Rwanda for three years now, just over three years. I am a career foreign service officer. I have worked for the State Department for 26 years. I've served on four continents um, and worked on uh, issues in all five. Uh, and uh, it is a real pleasure to be talking to you all because uh, you are the future of uh, that we are working for overseas every day and I'm hoping that as you're listening to me uh, you're thinking of good questions uh, to ask me. I'm going to just give a quick overview of our programs on Rwanda and then I'm going to pause for some general questions and then I'll go into depth on each one of the major issues that I talked about. Um, for those of you who haven't, who haven't uh, had a lot of time to study Rwanda, it's about the size of the state of Maryland. Uh, it is one of the smallest uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa. We have 12.2 million Rwandan citizens. Uh, and uh, when you think about 12.2 million people, that's all of Manhattan and New York, uh, greater New York area, uh, squeezed into Maryland, which means that we're the most densely populated country here in Rwanda in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the 
Uh, one of our big major uh, efforts here is trade and investment. We have four pillars to our foreign policy. Trade and investment, uh, especially looking at that, uh, making sustainable development a, a key to our, to our foreign policy. And uh, when you look at Rwanda's income levels at about uh, $718 a year is the average uh, income. And that's, that wasn't, a, I didn't misspeak, it's $718 a year, that's about $2 a day um, that people are living on. Uh, the, having beneficial trade and investment is really, really important. A second pillar is uh, promoting development. Uh, this is everything from agricultural development and improving agricultural outcomes so that people have better nu nutrition, um, but also figuring a way to help them do a, a better job at job creation um, so that people's incomes can go up. A, a third pillar of our policy is peace and security. Obviously, that's a pillar of our foreign policy everywhere around the world. But in Rwanda, that means um, focusing a lot on peacekeeping, and I'll get into depth uh, on that a little bit later. And our fourth pillar is promoting good governance. Uh, having a non-corrupt, transparent government that is responsive to the needs and will of, it, of its people is really important, especially in a country that has suffered a genocide, as Rwanda did uh, 24 years ago. Um, many of, I guess you guys weren't, weren't, weren't born and probably your older brothers and sisters weren't born at that point. Um, but, uh, 24 years ago, somewhere between 800,000 and a million people, nobody will ever really know, um, were killed by their fellow countrymen here in Rwanda, um, simply because of rather, uh, ridiculous, uh, semi-tribal claims. Um, Rwanda, Rwandans all speak the same language. They always have, uh, Kin Rwanda. They're monocultural, um, and they share the, all the same traditions. So this wasn't really a tribal issue. It was an issue of uh, people using ethnicity to divide. Um, and it's a, it's a trick that uh, autocrats have used throughout history around the world uh, to divide and conquer. And uh, the colon colonialists here did a very good job of that. And after independence, this was exacerbated, um, resulting in the genocide in 1994. They've done a remarkable job recovering from this tragedy, but uh, part of their development challenges are rebuilding a country that was destroyed. Um, of, the, of those 800,000 to a million people, that was at the time uh, when the population was only 7 million, that was one out of every seven Rwandans was killed by a fellow Rwandan. In addition, two million people fled. Um, so they lost half of the population of the country in 100 days. So if you can imagine the United States, that's equivalent of 150 million people fleeing across the borders or being killed in three months. That's, that's uh, the kind of wrenching experience that they went through. Um, so uh, peace and security is absolutely critical to everything we do here. but. Good governance, governance that's responsive to its people is also absolutely critical. Um, so I'll stop there with those outlines and take kind of any general questions. And I'd like to hear if there's specific topics that you'd also like me to cover. Um, and then I'll go into more depth on our pillars. Wonder Wonderful, thank you. So we have five groups of students that are on today. Um, we have Cut Bank, Columbus, Two, school, or two sites in Hamilton and Bozeman as well. Let's go ahead and start with Cutbank. We'll take um, two questions from Cutbank. Um, can I go to McKenna? Go see please. What rights do the people have? Okay. Okay. Do I have a second so question? A, yeah, what's your second question? What, oh, what, what is the feed of the future program? Mm. Feed the future, right? Yes. yes. Say yes. 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 <laughs> sure. Okay. So um, if I got the first question right, you were asking what rights do people have? Is that correct? Yes. yes. Yeah. So um, Rwandans have a, de uh, have a democratic government. They have the right to vote for their government. Um, we actually just had uh, the third presidential election since uh, the uh, Constitution was written and passed 
in 2003. Um, we had our third, the third presidential election here in Rwanda this last summer. Uh, so um, they have, however, only had one uh, president since the genocide, um, the current president, Paul Kagame. So he's been in power for a long time. Um, he, uh, there is a constitution. They have the right to freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Um, they have the right to change their government. Um, but given their history, that's a little bit difficult, frankly. Um, they are still working on trying to figure out how to live together well and how to live together peacefully without having to have a strong central government telling them they have to do that. Um, so if you can imagine what it must have been like during the genocide when it was neighbors killing neighbors. So I've talked to some of the survivors um, and they said, I watched my teacher kill my brother and I watched my priest kill my mom. And when you think about that, it's got to be pretty hard to trust the people who, you know, you live next door to, who you know, because they killed your family members. Um, and it's pretty hard to trust people again. So they're still working on that balance of making sure that they have justice and making sure that their rights are respected, but also making sure that they're peaceful and secure. Um, and so far they've been doing a pretty good job but if you're a critic of the government and you make jokes about President Kagame, you can get thrown in jail. So it's not like here where a late night com or in the United States where a late night comic can make jokes about, you know, President Obama or President Trump or whoever is president. Um, here you can't do that. Um, so there are some rights that we have that they do not have. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. yes. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, on the Feed the Future question, so the Feed the Future program is a USAID program that is meant to uh, develop the agricultural sector and primarily agrarian economies. So you live in Montana, you know what that's like where people work the land and are ranchers and things like that. It, that's true here. And 70 percent of the people who live in Rwanda work on the land. They have farms. Their farms are really small though because it's very, very densely populated here. So their farms are uh, about uh, 0.5 hectares, which is about an acre. So if you can imagine only an acre, that's your farm. Um, they, they are primarily subsistence farmers. And so Feed the Future is meant to say, okay, instead of just growing only barely enough food to feed your family, how are we gonna help you become a commercial farmer, figure out something that you can sell that will give you a better income than just growing enough food to barely feed your family? Um, and how do we make that sustainable and job creating so that as people come, uh, come of age, as more and more young people come of age here in Rwanda, they have a job um, instead of having to kind of just barely feed their families. And this is really important because Rwanda is a very young country. Um, so 60% of the population is under the age of 25, 50% is under, and 45% is under the age of 15, your age, 45%. Can you imagine if 45% of the United States were your age? Um, there's very few old people here. And so they need to create a lot of jobs. So Feed the Future is about that, but it's about using what they know, agriculture, to create those jobs. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, a lot. Thank you so much. Thank sure. you so much. Thank you so much, Cut Bank. Let's go to Mrs. Schubert's class in Hamilton. Do you have a question? Uh, hi, I guess our question would be, what can we do as students here in Montana to aid the Rwandan situation? Great. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have, do you have another question? I'm happy to take two if you, would, if you have another one. Um, so I guess it would be more of a follow-up to the previous question. What did the government attempt to do to stop the Rwandan genocide and why didn't that work? Great, Great. thank you. Okay, um, let, me, let me start with your second question first. So the problem during the genocide is that it was the government that was actually perpetrating the genocide. The government um, uh, was made up of the majority ethnicity uh, or group, um, which are, were called the Hutus. Um, 
and they the the president's plane was shot down. They'd been having a civil war for about four years. Um, the president's plane was shot down, sparking off the genocide. And the Hutus, who were the government, including the military and the police, um, were killing the Tutsis, who were the minority. Um, uh, they constitute about, still about, just under 20% of the population. Um, and so the government wasn't trying to stop the genocide. They were actually conducting the genocide. So the group that is now the government, the RPF, was, um, was the group that they were um, fighting against in the Civil War. And so they tried to stop the genocide. Um, and it, 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 when you're a rebel group that's been fighting a civil war, you don't have very much equipment, you don't have very much in the way of transport. So they basically had to walk across the country, um, invading and defeating the military as they went. Um, and shoving all the people who were perpetrating the genocide out of the country into Congo, um, which is next door. Uh, so it took about three months to do that. Uh, the UN actually had a peacekeeping force here in Rwanda at the time. It was headed by a Canadian, um, and uh, he tried to get more troops assigned to try and stop the genocide. And at the beginning, if he'd been able to get more troops, it might have stopped the genocide. You know, we don't know. History is a funny thing. It's hard to second guess. Um, but instead, the Security Council took away um, over half his troops and actually tried to shut down the mission. Um, and a bunch of Ghanaian and uh, Senegalese and Tunisian peacekeepers, as well as the Canadian peacekeepers who were attached to the peacekeeping mission, um, volunteered to stay. And their presence helped save tens of thousands of lives. Um, even though they couldn't do very much because they were a much smaller group, they did help. Um, so there's a great book if you want to read it called Shake Hands with the Devil um, that was written by that general that is really impactful. And if you want to read more about the genocide, I'd suggest that book. Um, what, what, what can you guys do? Well, you're the age of half the population of Rwanda. Um, and they're super, super eager to um, learn about outside cultures uh, and to, uh, quite frankly, learn English. They speak in Rwanda, and until 2009, their second language and their language of instruction in school was French, and then they switched to English. Uh, and if you can imagine your teachers and all of you having gone to whatever grade you're in right now in French and then switching in July to English for the rest of your schooling, including your teacher, wow. Or since you've gone to school in English, imagine switching to French and you have to take, you know, chemistry and math and history in a foreign language with with very little preparation. So they're they're still struggling learning English and learning how to learn in English and they need to practice. So um, having your school reach out and adopt a school um, here or, or adopt a classroom here in Rwanda so kids can practice English is great and our public affairs section who has helped set this up today um, has a lot of exchange programs with a lot of kids in school and we actually have over, uh, over 200 kids that we're working with right now on a program called access um, which helps them learn english um, and i'm sure they would be happy to help you guys figure out how to hook up with some of their english language learners um, and they can teach you about Rwanda and you can teach them about the United States and everybody gets to practice their English. So that, that's one idea for how to help. That sounds amazing. Right, hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's go to Bozeman, uh, the student there, and see what questions you have. Um, so you mentioned the question about, or you mentioned the idea of adopting a school, and I want to know what that, um, a little bit more about what that looks like, um, kind of overall, and how a school could go about that. Great. Um, there's a, actually a, a, a whole uh, group of people who work on um, exchange programs uh, at the State Department. They're called our public affairs sections overseas and our public diplomacy group in, in Washington, D.C. And I'd be happy to have our public affairs section send out some information to um, the Montana World Affairs Council to distribute to all the schools. You guys could go about doing that. 
because um, I think it would be easier for me to have, have them send you something rather than me trying to explain it because <laughs> it's a little complicated. But, but it, it is 100% doable and we actually have done this um, in um, when I lived in South Africa uh, and when I lived in India. Uh, we had uh, schools that had uh, both pen pal relationships uh, and uh, pen pal being not really actually pen and paper, it was email um, because you all never use pen and paper, you all use email. Um, and, uh, and text messages and WhatsApp and Instagram. And um, I'm sure you don't use Facebook because you're far too young. Um, only old people like me use Facebook. Um, it's true, actually. My mother uses Facebook, so you guys definitely don't use Facebook. Um, uh, but we can, we can um, help you guys set that up um, and we'd be happy to uh, share some information with you on that. Great. Did you have another question, Bozeman? Actually, I was curious um, what development strategies you've seen working well in Rwanda in the sense of like microloans, for an example. I know the economy has been really growing rapidly, and so we're studying development strategies in my AP Human Geography class. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious if you have any examples of things that have been working well that you're familiar with. Yeah, absolutely. So um, development is one of our pillars, as I mentioned, uh, of our policy as I mentioned at the beginning. And uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to mention. Um, first, uh, our biggest programs are in health and human development. If you're not healthy, it's kind of hard to learn. It's hard to hold down a job. Um, and uh, we have very, very large programs in health. Um, we're the single largest, just broadly speaking, the United States is the single largest bilateral donor for Rwanda. Um, we, uh, uh, over the last, Let's see, 15 years uh, with the PEPFAR program, which is the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, um, uh, have spent in Rwanda over a billion dollars uh, getting the HIV epidemic under control. Uh, so stopping people from dying, getting people on medication, making sure that we're preventing mother to child transmission, and then education, 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 and prevention, prevention, prevention. Um, our program has been very, very successful. Um, we uh, here in Rwanda, along with the Rwandan government um, and the people of Rwanda and local NGOs um, have gotten the epidemic uh, almost under what's called epidemic control. By the end of 2019, so in about, what, 15 months? No, a little bit more than that, 18 months. Um, we hope to have um, achieved the, the UN AIDS target of 90-90-90. 90% of people know their status, 90% of those who are positive are in treatment, and 90% of those are virally suppressed, which basically means you're not transmitting, the disease isn't growing, it's actually getting smaller. Um, so that's a huge success. If we can achieve that here, and we'll be one of the first seven countries in the world where that happens, it will be the first time in human history we've been able to contain a viral disease without a vaccine, um, which is a really big deal. Um, so that's, that's huge. Um, a, a second piece of what we do on development is education programs. Um, as I mentioned before, changing into English has been wrenching for their education system and lots and lots and lots of kids drop out of school. Um, and so what we've been focusing on is trying to make sure that kids get good primary education. They learn in Kin Rwanda for their first four years. So grade you know, pre-K or kindergarten and uh, equivalent, and then grades one, two, and three, they learn in Kin Rwanda. And then they switch to English in grade four. And so if you don't know how to read in the language you're speaking, it's kind of hard to switch to a foreign language. So we are working very hard through our USAID program on primary literacy and numeracy in Kin Rwanda, and then the switch year into English to try and make sure that kids are, are sticking with it and that they're understanding what's going on in school and that they can read and write um, in both languages um, so that they can actually benefit from their education system. The vast majority of kids drop out in grades four, five, and six because they basically can't make the switch because they don't read enough Kin Rwanda to be able to be fully literate, and then they try layering a foreign language on top of that is impossible. Um, another area of development where we've had a lot of huge successes in our agricultural trade de um, development program. Part of this is Feed the Future, um, which was mentioned earlier, but part of it is also public-private partnerships. So we, um, how many of you know of Lando Lakes? 
do people know Lando Lakes, the company? They do butter and cheese and stuff. Yeah. So um, they're, they're the biggest dairy cooperative. Yeah, I see lots of hands. There you go. They're the biggest dairy cooperative in the United States. So we partnered with Lando Lakes, our USAID program here, partnered with Lando Lakes. We put in 40% of the money, they put in 60% of the money for a three-year program um, to, to try and teach dairy farmers here in Rwanda, because lots of people have cows, lots of people uh, produce milk, but they weren't producing good milk, they, and they didn't know how to treat their cows to keep them healthy and things. So they expertise, taught people how to feed their cows better, how, the, how to do basic things like prevent mastitis, um, how to um, keep their milk um, cool, uh, and how, not, you know, how to treat their milk, make sure it gets to the dairy in the morning and again in the afternoon. Don't hold your morning milk or your night milk for the next shipment. You know, bring it every, every time um, so that it doesn't go off. And then teaching the dairy cooperatives how to treat the milk and test the milk to make sure it hadn't been watered down, it hadn't been held overnight, et cetera. And in three years, the um, production, without adding a whole lot more cows, a few, but not very many new cows, the dairy production in this country tripled from the same cows, just giving them better feed, better health care, and having, them have, having the farmers know what to do, and having the cooperatives know how to treat the milk. And farmer incomes doubled. Anybody who was a dairy farmer doubled their income in that same three three years. Now, if you can imagine a dairy farmer in the United States doubling his income in three years, you'd be like, whoa, rock and roll, you know. So that's what we what we were able to do with this program. And it's just one of those uh, programs that we have. We are working with um, with uh, the uh, founders of Tyson's Chicken to do the same thing with poultry. We just started that program this year. Um, and we're looking, we're trying to uh, look at uh, really improving and increasing their egg production uh, and also their, um, their layers, because the eggs per, per chicken that are laid and the quality of eggs. Um, so um, there's, there's a lot of good stuff we're doing out here uh, with, with a modest amount of, of assistance. And so we're, we're really proud that we're, we've been able to make that kind of difference. Thank you. I have a question from Columbus. Um, Columbus wants to know, what do you see as the biggest problem facing Rwanda today? Um, I think there's 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 two big problems, and they're the they're two of those other pillars I mentioned, and they're sort of in tension with each other: um, the peace and security pillar uh, and the governance pillar. So um, on the peace and security side, Rwanda is an extraordinarily peaceful and secure country right now, but it's also pretty authoritarian. As I mentioned, you can get thrown in jail for criticizing the president. And so one of the things that we, we spend a lot of time talking to them about is how do you uh, loosen control and allow your people to participate and criticize and have different ideas a bit more? How do you make sure that all voices are heard and that different ideas are brought forward? Um, so that governance side is really, really important. And for a country that's been through the kind of trauma that they've been through and has the kind of trust issues that they have, that's hard. It's really difficult. And so we spend a lot of time talking to them about those kind of issues. Um, on the peace and security side, um, while Rwanda itself is quite, is quite peaceful and very, very secure, we have very low crime rates here. Um, our crime rates are probably similar to Montana's. They're not like a big U.S. city. Um, they're, they're, they're very low. Um, and people here generally feel very safe in Rwanda. Their neighborhood is a tough neighborhood. Um, Eastern Congo, which is huge. So you got tiny little Rwanda, which is the size of Maryland, and a big, huge Congo, which is the size of the U.S. west of the Mississippi plus Alaska. Um, and Eastern Congo, which borders on, on Rwanda, um, has about 53 different rebel groups running around, um, all of whom are sort of criminal gangs and who occasionally come over the border trying to steal things in Rwanda, sometimes trying to kill people, sometimes just stumbling across the border because the border's not well marked. Um, and that's a problem um, when you have a whole bunch of people running around with, you know, rebel groups running around with guns right over your border. It, it's, it, it's not a very secure feeling. Likewise, Burundi, which is their southern border, um, it, it, 
had a very, very large um, set of civil unrest last year or two years ago, excuse me, when their president there decided to run for an unconstitutional third term. And um, they've had over uh, Rwanda's now housing over 85,000 uh, Burundi refugees, in addition to 75,000 long term Congolese refugees. So that's a, that's a pretty high burden for a small country. Um, but it also means that um, that they've got a lot of people who don't like their neighboring governments living in their country that they have to keep track of as well. So those are some of the challenges. Um, and then there's the bigger the bigger neighborhood challenges. They're a landlocked country, um, and so they're dependent on good goodwill with their neighbors, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, to get all of their goods from the ocean. It's kind of like Montana. You know, if you think of if Colorado had a, it had a civil war going on in Idaho, it had 53 rebel, rebel groups running around in it, to have a little bit of impact on your ability to get stuff from major airports and major major ports. And uh, that's, that's been a problem for Rwanda. So they, they spend a lot of time working with their neighbors to the east with whom they have very good relations, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, uh, to make sure that they can keep those trade routes open and keep growing jobs. Um, and then their other big problem is that they have such a young population. They need 12% economic growth in order to create enough jobs just to keep up with their population growth. And 12% is pretty hard. Um, in the U.S., we would be really happy to get the 5 to 6 or 7% that they've been having for the last 10 years. But 12% is really hard. And they need to start hitting um, bigger numbers or they're not going to create enough jobs for their, for their young people. Thank you. And I believe we have not heard from uh, Mrs. Horat's uh, group. Hello. Um, we have a couple questions. Sure, go ahead. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. My lights just went out. I'm not moving around. And... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Apologies. So... I was just wondering, what countries, I guess, interact the best with Rwanda? Okay. And you had a couple questions you said, so why don't you go ahead and ask me the other one. Our second question would be, um, did the Rwandan genocide result in any lasting negative impacts on Rwandan's neighbors that have had to be um, dealt with? Yeah, okay. Um, so those two questions are sort of linked to each other. Um, so I'll go with the second one first because it then leads into, into today. Um, so yes, uh, Congo was very deeply affected by Rwanda's genocide because, as I mentioned, when the, um, when the now government st in stopping the genocide, invading the country, and defeating the, the genocidaire government and, and the then army, um, they shoved and pushed all those people because they were coming from the east and the north. They pushed them south and west, as you do with a big military movement. And south and west is Congo. And so about 2 million Rwandans ended up in Congo in refugee camps. And um, sorry for the announcement in the background. It's uh, our Marines are securing our building. So <laughs> um, the um, uh, so the Congolese had a huge problem. Um, with these uh, these very large refugee camps, um, and some of the rebel movements that are currently still going on in Congo are the remnants of those refugee camps and the remnants of the genocidaire government. Um, there are still uh, uh, eight, I think it's eight, yes, eight um, um, uh, genocidaires who were indicted by the International Criminal Tribunal, the UN Tribunal for Rwanda, and these are people who were high up in government who were in charge of killing tens of thousands of people. Um, and um, there are still eight of them who are on the loose, and we believe that probably five of them are in eastern Congo. Um, so that has left a la lasting um, problematic relationship between those two countries. Um, also, Rwanda, the, the current government, which was then the rebel movement before the genocide, with whom, with whom the uh, Rwanda government had been having a war since 1990, that rebel movement came out of Uganda, and and um, was supported by President Museveni, the the then president of Uganda and the still president of uh, of Uganda, 
Um, so you would think that they would have very warm relationships, and in general they do. But it's kind of like cousins who've lived too close to each other, that they sometimes get into pretty big arguments. Um, or brothers and sisters where you really love each other, you, but you know way too much about each other and you know how to push each other's buttons. They're kind of like that with the Ugandans. And they push each other's buttons. Uh, and so right now they're having a kind of a cooling off period with the, with the Ugandans after kind of six months of escalating tension. It's kind of like when you've been fighting with your brother and then he comes home and, you know, two days later he does some, he messes with your, your stuff and then you go and the next day mess with his stuff. They were kind of doing that. Um, and now the bigger, the, 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 the adults in the room have basically said, okay, let's, let's cool this down. Uh, but they, they do have close enough relationships that it sometimes is too close. Um, so, and then Burundi, they've always had a weird relationship with Burundi and, uh, Burundi and Rwanda are, are, are like also sort of like cousins. They, they, their kings actually used to be honest to God cousins when they both had kings before in um, and their languages are mutually comprehensible. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, uh, Swedish and Danish, like you can talk the same, you can each talk your own language, but you can understand enough of what the other person is saying. Um, it, and so they have this very close relationship, but it means that they also mess in each other's business a lot. Um, and that's always been the case um, because they all know each other. They've all got cousins on both sides of the border. They all go back and forth. They trade a lot with each other. They're similar in size. They've got similar problems. So, um, so, and part of that stems from they each had civil wars in 1994. Um, you know, the genocide it was the end of the Rwandan civil war. They and the refugees, about a million refugees, went into Burundi helped start the Burundi civil war, um, which then lasted for 10 years. So, so these are all linked and I've probably question in answering the, or the first question in answering the second. Um, but Rwanda does have really good relationships with Ethiopia. Um, the government in Ethiopia, um, came into power in 1991. Um, it's a democratically elected government. There are, um, going to be electing their third president soon. Um, and um, that government has always been very traditionally close to, to this Rwandan government. Um, they also have very good relations with Kenya, uh, very good relationship with Tanzania, although that one sometimes has gone back and forth. Um, but right now they, it, it's, it's going quite well. So, um, so they do have a lot of good relations. Also, Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, is currently the chair of the AU, the African Union. So he is, he's got a very big stage um, right now. He's running the continent-wide body uh, for the next year. So there's a lot of uh, other issues that they are involved in, including uh, peacekeeping operations in South Sudan, in, uh, in Sudan, in Central Africa Republic, um, and uh, police peacekeeping in Haiti and in Mali. So I don't know if that answers your question. It did. Thank you very much. Sure. Ambassador, we have about 15 minutes left. I'm wondering if there are any topics that you would like to explore with the students that we have not touched on through the questions. Yeah, um, uh, there's uh, two things that I, I, I'd like to let you know about because we haven't covered trade and investment very much and jobs are really, really important. And um, just so, so you guys know this because I think it's important, um, the U.S. is the number one investor in Rwanda bigger than China, bigger than the, the European Union. Um, and uh, we help have helped create, um, since I've been here, um, uh, about 2,000 jobs in the United States and about a similar amount, maybe even a few more, here in Rwanda, just through our U.S. companies investing. So we've got companies like Culligan Water that wasn't here when I arrived that now runs half of Rwanda, or excuse me, half of the city of Kigali's water treatment plant and is building four other water treatment plants around Rwanda. That supports about 200 jobs in Illinois, uh, the headquarters of Culligan Water, but it also supports about 800 construction jobs here in Rwanda, as well as plant managers and things like that, and they have clean water. If you can imagine when I, when I got here,
the the about half the city of of Kigali had no water. Now forget dirty water; they didn't have water, um, and so the people were having to go with buckets on their heads to another part of the city to go get water. Um, we're working on changing that um, through our investment, but it's also creating jobs, um, and that's that's really important um, because at the end of the day. Um, it's not just about what governments can do and what regulations can do. It's also about what private business can do. So it doesn't matter um, where, where, what path you follow um, for your future jobs. You can always contribute um, uh, and help both grow the United States economy, but also grow economies overseas. And having strong trading partners who are democratic governments makes them more secure, makes them more prosperous, but it also makes us more secure and more prosperous. And I always tell Rwandans, you know, we, we invest in our assistance programs, we invest in our health programs, we invest in our agriculture programs and our trade development programs, not because it's charity, because it's an investment in the future. It's an investment in kids, it's an investment in better e economics, it's an investment in peace, and in making sure that we all are healthier, wealthier, um, and have better relationships with each other. So that's really why we're here. Um, and that's really what embassies do every day. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to kind of sum up with that. Um, and then, you know, for any of you who are, who are interested in overseas stuff, which I, I think you might be since you're here, um, there are a lot of exchange programs available, and I would urge you to look on our www.state.gov website, and there's a yellow button over on the right-hand side that says, um, that says uh, exchanges, internships, um, and jobs. And you should go look at that, because um, there are lots and lots and lots of opportunities. Um, we have, I'm just trying to think how many students it is, um, coming over here every year. I may have the number actually. Um, if I look close, yeah, we have um, about 1,500 Rwandans who um, have participated in academic exchanges with the United States. And um, we have uh, over, uh, over 35 different um, high schools and universities who come over here on summer exchange programs every year who, who do really, really terrific um, work study programs. And then we also have um, U.S. government exchange programs, things like the Fulbright scholarships. Um, we have English language fellow programs to come over and teach English. Um, so there's lots and lots of different kinds of opportunities. So I'd urge you, if you're interested in foreign affairs, to look at that website and see what's out there and available. Um, because traveling the world and seeing and getting to know people is not only really fun, it's really important. The world's getting smaller. Um, and yeah, having grown up in the Midwest, I was, I grew up in Minnesota. I grew up in a small town in Minnesota um, of 35,000 people. Um, and I went to, I lived in the same house from the time I was born till I graduated from high school. Uh, I went to the same school with kids from the time I was four until I graduated. And um, my world was pretty small, and I, um, I had never been on an airplane until I was 18, and I, was, I went to university. And uh, now I've, you know, traveled to over 80 different countries and have lived all over the world. I speak four languages, um, and that's partly just because um, I got involved with people who were involved with international stuff, and they pointed me towards the Fulbright program. Um, when I was in university. So uh, don't think just because uh, you don't live near an ocean or you, you haven't been to Africa uh, that you won't. Uh, I didn't think I'd ever go to Africa and now I've lived in Africa for the last six years. So um, the world is getting small, smaller and please do explore it. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question from each group? Absolutely. All right, let's start with Cut Bank. Cut Bank. Oh, excuse me. Cut Bank. Yeah, we're going to go with one question. This is Home Gun. Are you, are you oh, there? Yes, still? I'm sorry. He's oh, sorry. Um, we're going to ask our question right now. Thank you. Sorry about that. 
How did you get involved with working in the White House? So I got involved working in the White House because I worked for the State Department. So the way that you, um, I, I was what's called seconded over to the White House. So it basically means that the White House got to borrow me um, for three years. So the State Department still paid my salary, but uh, the White House got, got uh, my work. Um, so that's a very common thing for both military and foreign service officers to do. And the way you become a State Department Foreign Service Officer is that there's an, first of all, you have to go to college and you have to graduate from with a bachelor's degree. Once you do that, you can apply. Um, you, you, a lot of people get master's degrees, some people get PhDs, but it's not required. Um, you can apply via um, an examination process uh, that takes place uh, a bunch of times a year. And again, that's under our jobs uh, piece on our website. And um, if you pass the written exam, then there's a full day oral exam where you have to actually show up in person in Washington, D.C. And you spend an entire day um, uh, getting a whole battery of different kinds of exams. Uh, and uh, I passed that. And then you have to have a security clearance and a health clearance. Uh, and I passed those and they offered me a job. And uh, so it's a, it's a pretty uh, rigorous examination process. About 30,000 people take the initial exam every year. About 1,000 people get through to the oral stage and about 200 of those are hired. So, um, so it's, a, it's a rigorous process, but it is definitely doable. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to Mrs. Schubert's class in Hamilton. Hi, so um, we've heard about some of the bigger, more sweeping projects that you've done, but we were just wondering what might your day-to-day -day job include? Um, what's a day in your shoes like? <laughs> a day in my shoes is often confusing is what it is. Um, uh, it, it, ambassadors don't control their schedules very well um, or very, very much. Um, because there's always events that happen that we don't have control over. That, um, so, you know, it, there could be an American citizen who's in distress. Um, we've unfortunately had a couple people. We have, um, many of you may have heard of the mountain gorillas here. Um, and we've had a couple of people who've gotten really bad altitude sickness because those, those mountain gorillas are, are at around 9,000 feet, which is high enough to get uh, altitude sickness. And we actually, this summer, unfortunately, had somebody who died, um, who didn't pay attention to the fact that they weren't feeling well and didn't come down fast enough. Um, and so we have to deal with their family. So I, I have to call their family and tell them and help them figure out how, how to deal with that. Um, it, you know, last, last week I got a call. I walked into the office on Monday morning and the foreign minister um, was on, uh, had called up and asked to see me. I was not planning to see the foreign minister that day. But the foreign minister wants to see you, you go to her office and see her. Um, and so I had to clear other things off of my schedule and move things around um, and go see the foreign minister. Um, uh, on Monday, I'm going up uh, to um, open up a program that USAID is doing on disease control um, in uh, waterborne diseases uh, in a village uh, that's about two and a half hours away. So I'll, spend, I'll get up at you know, five o'clock in the morning, I'll be in my car by six, I will uh, arrive at the village in, at about 8.30. Uh, there'll be a program. I'll get back in my car. I'll drive back to the, to the city. Uh, and then what else do I have? I have a meeting with my Peace Corps group. And then I have an internal um, award ceremony for my employees here at the embassy. And uh, I have a reception and a dinner that evening. Um, so. And that's pretty typical that my day will usually start. Um, I get up every morning at five. I usually am in the office by 715 and I rarely am done with my day before 830 or nine at night. Thank you. Great. Thank um, you. Yes. Columbus would like to know, does Rwanda have any mineral resources that other countries may be looking at developing? Yeah, Rwanda does have some some mineral resources. They're small, but they're important. Um, so tin, which I'm sure all of you have heard of, 
um, is mined here. It's also mined in other places, but they have very high purity tin, um, and they export a lot of that. Um, they also have a mineral called tungsten, um, which is used in light filaments for light bulbs, um, and especially um, in, um, uh, sorry, uh, the LED lights. Uh, tungsten is used as part of LED lights. So um, important for high-tech uh, lighting. Uh, and again, they have very high purity deposits, and uh, tungsten is a fairly rare mineral. So there's only about six countries that have commercial quantities. Rwanda is one of them. Um, the most important one that they have is a mineral called tantalum, also known as coltan in its more refined form. Um, and for anybody who has a cell phone on them, which I'm sure all of you do, um, if not two or three, or an iPad, or uh, you know, any small micro device, um, that is what keeps your, your cell phone from catching on fire. It's what cools your cell phone. It is absolutely 100% essential for all microelectronics. Uh, and there are only three countries in the world that have, that have deposits of it. Eastern, Congo, Eastern Congo, right across the border, Burundi, and Rwanda. That's it. All coal time is sourced from those countries. There's a little bit in uh, Western United States and Canada, but not enough um, for us to even come close to satisfying our own industry. Um, so that's a pretty big export item here. Um, they also have a little bit of um, some other rare earth minerals, but not enough for big commercial quantities. Thank you. And then finally, Mrs. Moritz, class, do you have a final question? Hi, yes. Um, I would like to know what is Rwanda's uh, most prevalent resource? Well, Rwanda's most prevalent resource, and the thing they depend on most for their income is agriculture. Um, uh, they grow a lot of food. Um, uh, crops are bananas uh, and, um, and um, uh, cooking bananas. Um, and then they, um, next after that is potatoes. Uh, they grow eight or nine different varieties of sweet potatoes. They grow what they call Irish potatoes, what we would just call regular potatoes. Um, <laughs> they're, you know, the regular white potatoes. Um, they also grow rice. They grow um, a lot of passion fruit and mangoes and avocados and mushrooms and tomatoes and eggplants and carrots. Um, so lots and lots and lots of veggies. Um, and they sell a lot of that stuff to their neighboring countries. About... about uh, 30% of their vegetable crop is sold to their neighboring countries, and increasingly, they're starting to sell to Europe. Um, they have now two cold storage flights um, that go to um, that go to Europe with green beans and things like that. Um, on the purely commercial front, coffee and tea. They have their um, big coffee producers. You can buy Rwandan coffee at Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks has their regional lab here uh, in, in Rwanda, and I'm proud to say that they have been were a partner with USAID um, when they first came in here 10 years ago, and, they, and USAID stopped funding, and they stayed in, and uh, they're now uh, the biggest purchaser of Rwanda's coffee. Um, likewise, the largest uh, uh, tea plantation here in Rwanda and tea manufacturer is an American-owned company called Sawarta Tea. Um, they're out of New York. And uh, they are also the longest inve term investor in all of Rwanda. They've been here for 42 years and they employ 3,000 people. Mm. Ambassador Bartuggles, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And the Montana World Affairs Council, thank you for making this, this event possible. And thank you to all the students and teachers that participated. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, and thank you for the great questions um, from all of you. You guys have, have read up, and I hope it was helpful. And, you know, we'll get back to you on the, ex on the uh, school exchange programs. Wonderful. Thank you, and have a, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was amazing. Thank, thank you. you.